Okay, good afternoon everyone. So I will uh, take you through my journey, my journey with MySQL and uh, through uh, uh, almost now uh, two, uh, two decades, uh, not just one. And for me it all starts in uh, 1999 when uh, I was a student in uh, Moscow State University. And by the way you see there is snow here, right? Because wherever you show Russia you should be showing snow. What is that? Okay. Let's see, is that my phone? Maybe that is. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I got MySQL uh, to be, uh, to use MySQL in the uh, first startup I uh, co-founded in uh, 1999, uh, which was called uh, SpyLog. And you think, you know, Russia, SpyLog, what kind of startup is that? Well, it was not that kind of uh, startup. It was pretty much Google uh, Analytics uh, of the days, and at that time we would uh, use uh, MySQL for those kind of things. Remember, there is no Hadoop, there is no Spark, there is no ClickHouse, there is nothing uh, uh, else in the open source uh, area uh, at that time. So uh, I got to use MySQL, and I started with MySQL 323 Alpha. I was student. I was not thinking a lot, right? So I used the uh, alpha software version uh, at that time. And actually, I learned a lot through, uh, uh, through using that very, uh, very version of software. Believe it or not, at that time, the MySum was only uh, introduced. And MySQL was kind of uh, uh, so small uh, what uh, uh, Michael Medenius wanted to personally pr reply to many of my questions. And actually, Monty is here today. Monty, can you wave? So the one and, no, not the one and only, but one of a few MySQL founders, the Monty, is out there. So you can also chase him down for questions as well after we talk. Well, I didn't ask him, but you know, Monty is always good for a good conversation. So what kind of challenges we had in 1999 with MySQL? MySum, that means MySum table logs. That is uh, kind of very painful. My choice, using the alpha software, we also had a lot of crushing, so a lot of uh, uh, learning uh, experience. And we also had a pro some basic uh, and funny problem by these days, is what uh, Linux version at that time would have two gigabyte file limits for many uh, file systems, right? So you couldn't have quite uh, 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 large tables. And also with my sum, I had to face those problems of uh, the table uh, checks and repairs, right, for uh, taking a lot of time. Now, in 99, we had those, uh, my, some uh, MySQL tricks you guys are well aware of for by now, perhaps, such as we would shard to my, a number of MySQL nodes for, for scalability. And even because of my, my some table logs, we would shard to have uh, multiple tables and database on the single node, right, to make those uh, uh, less painful. And we would have to build lots and lots of summary tables because I would guess aggregating large amount of data in uh, MySQL uh, was, uh, uh, was never quite, uh, quite pretty. Now, uh, about the same time in 2000, uh, isn't, uh, the MySQL goes open source of GPL license. Before that, and I think uh, uh, many people don't know it, MySQL was not quite open source license. It was still available for, um, for, uh, for free if you would use proper operating system like Linux. But if you choose to uh, create pains for developers to build MySQL on Windows, then you would have to pay for that. In 2001, we get MySQL 323 uh, when GA or, or stable, and that is also the time when in the DB storage engine was uh, introduced in the MySQL uh, Max edition, as well as we had an initial release of MySQL uh, replication. Another interesting event uh, at that time is that the MySQL was uh, uh, sued by Progress, a newsfare company, and there was this very famous uh, lawsuit of uh, kind of testing a GPL uh, in a court uh, at that time. Obviously, uh, MySQL uh, won, and that's why it's uh, still continuing journey. 
Now, for me, the challenges in 2001 was stabilizing in a DB. You know, as a, usually I kind of jumped on that in the very early software, and then uh, I learned a lot, and then uh, I had a lot of downtime. Uh, but that is wonderful when you're running your own startup, right? You don't have a boss to fire you. So uh, I could uh, uh, have those kind of mm, uh, experiments. And also we had to do a lot of work to get a MySQL replication to work. Because MySQL replication first was kind of uh, relatively simple. Hey, let us go ahead and stream all our update statements. Maybe we'll sort of supply a little bit of uh, metadata uh, information if I'm at uh, what was this time at uh, uh, statement execution or uh, what was a random seed, right? But the early days, uh, the MySQL uh, statement replication worked only in, in most cases, right? Uh, now, the next stage for me was in 2002, I joined MySQL, and uh, I did uh, a little bit of, uh, of development, but frankly, that was not my thing. And I uh, really transitioned to MySQL support and consulting uh, and led uh, what was called MySQL High Performance uh, uh, Group. In 2002, we were uh, powering what was later known as WebPoint2. And a lot of Web.2 was uh, based on, uh, on MySQL. If you really look back at the companies uh, founded in early 2000, and if you look at the open source databases, MySQL was by far the, uh, their mm, uh, majority. It may not have been completely only game in town, but was uh, close to that. And focus for that was uh, changing to the EV query optimization Right, or uh, as well as working with a lot of those larger companies with, uh, uh, with uh, which would be implementing sharding. Also in 2002, uh, we got this website which is called bugsmysql.com. Now the interesting thing is before that, MySQL uh, was managing bugs through a mailing list. And the goal was uh, what there should not be any bugs uh, in release. But the truth is that it was easy to achieve uh, when you have a ma uh, mailing list because you can just, you know, uh, uh, forget some emails. But as, uh, but as soon as we got bugsmysql.com, I think we never had a release which have uh, all the bugs for that uh, are, are completely closed, right? So uh, that's kind of a funny thing, right? So if you want to promise there is no bugs in your software, remember, don't implement a bug tracking database. MySQL in 2003, that is when MySQL 4.0 uh, was released, which had an uh, improved uh, uh, replication and query cache, and was, was the first MySQL user conference taking place back in, uh, uh, in Silicon Valley. And I think that was a very important transformational for, uh, for, uh, for MySQL because we had brought so many people together to really compare notes and really be able to, uh, you know, face to face. Uh, to talk face to face rather than you know just having uh, communicating through mailing list and so on and so forth, right? And I think there was kind of really uh, uh, explosion of the MySQL uh, adoption thinking and the best practice at that time. One of the pretty famous outcome from that is uh, talks by Brad Fitzpatrick from Life Journal. Anybody remembers Life Journal? No? So, some? Okay. Yeah. So that was a. Uh, a pretty popular blogging uh, software of the time, which uh, used MySQL, and um, they really popular, uh, talk a lot about how exactly the things are organized uh, in LiveJournal. And that was well before it really became popular, right? Because right now we see all those, you know, Netflix engineering blogs, Facebook, Google, everybody mostly talks about how they're building things, right? But that was not. Uh, too much uh, uh, so in uh, early 2000s. And what is interesting in, uh, in this kind of back-end architecture today, we can see a lot of a very uh, similar concept we still use building MySQL application. There would be some sort of your global database with metadata, there would be some sort of shards with the user data, we would probably have something uh, like a load balancer, there would be some caching, right, with memcache and so on and so forth, right? A lot of those concepts which are quite similar. 
So in 2003, if you look at what kind of best practice you would adopt for MySQL, one is caching from mCache. That became uh, very important and uh, popular, right? So if you can't have MySQL to, to handle the load, cheat by caching. And then also you would have a massive replication, right? So you, you would often have the MySQL node, which would replicate to 10 slaves. You would often have even people using hierarchical replication. They would have 10 slaves, which each of them would replicate to, let's say, five more slaves, and all the kind of really massive MySQL uh, replication hierarchy became a commonplace. In 2004, MySQL 4.1 is available. And uh, I would uh, call that uh, first uh, a checkbox release, because at that time, a lot of MySQL focus was driven by uh, sales and marketing, hey, how we can get the f uh, new features which could be done uh, uh, to, you know, serve some customers, right, which are asking for them. So for MySQL, uh, we have uh, uh, sub-queries, which kind of are introduced to MySQL, but they're uh, never quite uh, uh, optimized uh, until many years later. Or prepared statements, which I think are still in MySQL is uh, 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 by far less mature than uh, you know, Postgres or a uh, number of commercial mm -hmm. databases. And that was also a year where MySQL cluster or NDB has became first uh, available. For myself, I started blogging about MySQL. And I pull out, which is my first uh, post uh, on the Life Journal uh, about uh, MySQL, which is talking about the fact that MySQL uh, doesn't have a hash join and how you can work it around. The funny thing is, what is 14 years later, MySQL still doesn't have a hash joint. So I guess that is still, uh, uh, still relevant. Now, in 2005, we got MySQL 5.0, which I would call uh, the second uh, checkbox release, which added store procedures, views, and triggers. But it wasn't kind of uh, very well uh, uh, integrate, I would say, right? You would get triggers, and we wouldn't quite uh, mix with replication well, and uh, uh, all this kind of stuff. But hey, you know what? We got a lot of uh, checkboxes uh, in MySQL 5.0. It almost looked like an enterprise database uh, at that point. But another important change to MySQL came with Oracle uh, acquired Innobase, the creators uh, of, uh, of InnoDB. Now, the thing which uh, I think is very impactful for MySQL, the outside of the release community, we got Puppet release. And Puppet was the first uh, of a new generation of automation framework. You know, you think uh, Puppet, Chef, uh, Ansible, uh, which really uh, started to ingrain people in new thinking. You should not be manually managing your databases because that doesn't scale. You should puppetize everything or, you know, automate it with Chef and so on. Uh, and so forth. That wasn't quite a commonplace in 2005, but that was the start of the practices. In 2006, MySQL was crying with inner base acquisition fell out. Because, because even by 2006, the most large scale MySQL users would be using InnoDB uh, as a storage engine. Right? So what MySQL did is what they, uh, they bought a company called Netfrastructure, and Jim Starkey, which was Firebird founder, joined MySQL uh, to implement the Falcon storage engine, which was supposed to be uh, uh, a much better replacement for, uh, for InnoDB. Anybody remember Falcon? Oh, yes, we have some, uh, uh, some, some heroes. What also happened, interesting in this case, is uh, we started to uh, uh, have Hadoop being, uh, being available, right? And why that is important, because over years, we have started to see some of those analytical workloads crunching through, through large amount uh, of data, moving from MySQL to, uh, to Hadoop, right? Because MySQL didn't quite was uh, created uh, well for that. For myself, in 2006, uh, I started on MySQL performance, uh, performance blog, Right, and that was, uh, it was uh, our pretty popular blog about MySQL performance um, uh, for a long time. And you see, we picked uh, here the, uh, the WordPress theme, Boxy by, by Gold, which nobody else used, and maybe you can see why. 
but, uh, uh, but that means even from very far, afar, our website was very well uh, recognizable. And that's also a year uh, what I started Percona to give with Vadim uh, Tkachenko. And we were focused on, uh, on performance. Percona pretty much stays for performance consultants, right? That's where the name comes from. And our focus was helping companies to scale, to optimize uh, MySQL. And we really worked with uh, a lot of uh, uh, companies using MySQL at scale uh, at that time. In 2008, we got MySQL 5.1 uh, 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 coming out, which would uh, include features like partitioning and uh, row-based uh, uh, replication. Right now, uh, uh, again, if all those features which we added, it was understood MySQL needs more kind of uh, uh, safe, kind of mature uh, replication technology and statement-based replication. We also have some microsystem acquires uh, MySQL uh, AB uh, at that time, right? That's the first acquisition in the MySQL uh, history. Uh, another thing is what that is a year when we can see the born of a modern cloud. That is where Amazon EC2, uh, right, uh, uh, has uh, became generally available. And again, while the cloud was not main, nearly mainstream at that time, that's when, when MySQL started its, uh, its cloud journey. In 2008, we at Percona uh, saw a lot of uh, what I would call the uh, dysfunction between Oracle slash InnoDB and slash, uh, Sun slash MySQL uh, uh, in this case, right? Because, uh, because MySQL was really, uh, while users wanted to use InnoDB and to see that being better, MySQL and Sun wanted to uh, downplay InnoDB and kind of hold off innovation out there and uh, uh, so it's what easy to replace with, uh, uh, with, with Falcon. And we had a uh, certain opportunity uh, out there, and actually we need, uh, because we saw what uh, it was impossible uh, to scale in the GB without actually writing code and fixing some problems out there. And that is how we created Percona XRDB, the fork of uh, in the GB. Uh, that is also then uh, uh, we uh, put a lot of time and effort and uh, uh, wrote high performance MySQL book. That is a, a called second edition, but actually uh, that was a completely uh, the rewritten book uh, at that time. And some of you may, uh, may read that. In 2009, we see the second acquisition in the MySQL times, right? We see Oracle acquire Sun Microsystems and so it gets MySQL. And oh my gosh, that was uh, uh, a big deal for everybody. Because in MySQL, we were out there to get Oracle, right? It was uh, the whole idea of a company, hey, we are going to get out there and democratize MySQL uh, market and kind of uh, really make uh, Oracle pretty much irrelevant. But that's not what happened, and I think that was the, uh, the shock for a lot of people in the team. Right? And that's where we get a lot uh, also uh, from that as an outfall, a lot of those uh, rumors what uh, Oracle will kill MySQL. Have you heard about that? No? Anyone? Yeah, well, so what is it? Uh, nine years and counting, right? Uh, yet to see. Uh, Monty started his second database company, Maria, uh, uh, MariaDB at that time, or MariaDB project, right, the company had a, uh, a different name, to, to ensure the future of MySQL and to have an uh, independently uh, run MySQL uh, alternative. That is also, uh, also the date when Amazon RDS for MySQL, the first database as a service, uh, became available. And also that is a, uh, when we get the uh, MongoDB Right, uh, uh, where I would say the leading NoSQL uh, database uh, was first released. 2010, we got MySQL 5.5, which uh, has a lot of focus on scalability, finally. Right, I would say in 5.5, we get a first big improvement in uh, energy performance because the teams were integrated, uh, Falcon was ditched, and uh, really a lot of focus was to making NDB actually work very well. Uh, with, uh, with MySQL. That is also where we see 
first trees of a performance schema as a way to really understand what's going on inside MySQL better. Now, if you look at the highlights of the ecosystem at that time, that is where we got OpenStack the initial release, right? And kind of su supporting the other uh, thing in the cloud ecosystem, the phenomenon of a, of a private cloud, right? People able not only you to use solutions like uh, Amazon, right, using their infrastructure, but have the completely open source uh, way to uh, write cloud in your data center. From Percona, uh, uh, from Percona side, we have decided it's not enough just to modify in a DB storage engine. There are some performance improvements and the features we want to do on the server side. So we created, at that time, Percona Server, which was based on uh, our uh, extra DB storage engine and a lot of additional uh, uh, improvements. Also, uh, uh, there it was, for years, uh, the, the problem of uh, taking hot backups for InnoDB, right? In, in the base time, it was actually a rather inexpensive proposition to go and buy uh, InnoDB backup from InnoBase. When Oracle acquired, it was wrapped in into the MySQL support, which was actually a pretty expensive value proposition, and a lot of uh, uh, folks in community were suffering not uh, having a good solution for open source backups. Well, so we created one, which is uh, uh, known as uh, Percona, uh, Percona Extra Backup, which I guess some of you uh, have used. So what do we, do we have a challenges in 2010 with MySQL? Scaling with MySQL with multiple CPU cores. You know, by the end of the first decade uh, of uh, 2000, CPUs have not been getting really faster. They have been becoming wider, right? They have been getting more and more cores, so uh, it was not only the question of some big ass expensive servers, right, to scale to multiple cores. Even a very basic servers would have an in ever increasing number of cores, and MySQL was not really designed to scale very well uh, with those multi cores first. So uh, that required a lot of uh, engineering and uh, performance uh, tuning. We also had a lot of work put in the MySQL deployment automation. We have a lot of very large MySQL environment at that time, which had to be managed by very small teams of, uh, of DBAs, right? And that's where the automation of, uh, uh, you know, using Puppet to manage MySQL and stuff like that uh, became important. Uh, and also, much more prevalent cloud made MySQL automation more feasible, right? Because it's much easier to automate everything than if you have a programmable infrastructure and you can spin up, spin down instances, right? compared to when your automation is limited, but in the end, you have to have somebody to come and write for a new server. The specific problem in MySQL uh, at that time was also replication failover automation. Unlike some of the modern uh, database system, MySQL doesn't uh, really have a, a replication failover built in. So for example, you have a master and mu multiple slaves, and your master crashed, then what will happen in MySQL? Well, Pretty much nothing, right? You'll have a bunch of uh, slaves trying to connect to a master which doesn't exist to recreate that uh, replication infrastructure to select the new master, ad uh, adjust your load balancer or, or configuration and so on and so forth. That had to be done manually and there have been a number of tools uh, created at that time to help with that, such as uh, uh, MySQL Multi-Master Manager or uh, later MHA. In 2012, uh, uh, looking at that problem, and as well as uh, prevalence of a cloud, we have introduced our Perconex DB cluster uh, technology, which is really uh, the new generation uh, at that time, cloud-friendly, high ability for, uh, for, uh, for MySQL. In 2013, we get MySQL 5.6. And that was, again, focused on better scalability, performance schema, uh, getting uh, GTIDs to make replication uh, uh, at least somewhat easier to manage. A lot of improvements to the optimizer. For example, remember I mentioned what the sub-queries in MySQL 4.1 were introduced, but uh, many common sub-query types couldn't really, you know, execute uh, in completing the century. In MySQL 5.6, a lot of uh, such uh, uh, optimizations were uh, added. And that is also the day, uh, the year, where initial release of a Docker happened. 
right, just for, uh, for a background. In 2014, we have a first release of Amazon RDS Aurora. And why is that, uh, I think, interesting? Because what Aurora, uh, Amazon Aurora is, is this is a new kind of a software which happens uh, with the cloud systems, which is kind of based on open source, but not uh, open source uh, 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 itself, right? And which really uh, promises some additional features, additional scalability, and so on and so forth, but at, at the risk of uh, uh, very serious lock-in, similar to which pretty much comes with uh, 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 with your uh, uh, proprietary software. In 2015, we got uh, MySQL 5.7 available. In MySQL 5.7, uh, we had, uh, it's kind of getting boring, right? Again, even more scalability. We have a JSON document store, parallel multi, uh, and multi-source replication. And what we can see in this case is that is uh, there we see a lot of uh, NoSQL and especially JSON-focused solutions giving MySQL some heat. Because by that time, a lot of a new generation of developers, they would not really understand relational algebra and this kind of complicated language called SQL, right? They would write their stuff in JavaScript, they would understand, uh, you know, JSON object, right? And uh, that is a way they would uh, like to work with their persistence. That is why a lot of them would use MongoDB at that time, right? And the MySQL was there to respond to that trend by starting to introduce JSON functions and also the document store, which is a MySQL feature, which provides an interface quite similar to MongoDB. That is also the year where ProxySQL was initially released. And in ProxySQL, I think that is a uh, open source tool which you can uh, really hear a lot about those days if you're part of MySQL community, which really has a lot of very nice features for load balancing and otherwise managing MySQL traffic, right? You can use it for all kinds of things from implementing your database firewalling to, to caching to uh, load manage management, right, or implementing some basic sharding. So uh, uh, that is very uh, a very important uh, technology for MySQL ecosystem those days. From our side at Percona, that is where we acquired to a company called TokuTech, uh, the, uh, TokuDB, which uh, has a TokuDB storage engine to, uh, to integrate that in the, uh, in the MySQL. What kind of challenging did we uh, see with MySQL in 2015? Well, as I mentioned, that's where we get a lot of new SQL, uh, no SQL uh, solutions coming up. And the wonderful thing with those solutions is there was no need for a manual sharding anymore, right? If you look at solutions like MongoDB, Cassandra, uh, and so on and so forth, right? They uh, have sharding which is pretty much done automatically for you. You just have to, you need to scale, you add some, node to, some more node to a cluster, and that works. Yes, you have to trade a lot of SQL features for that, right? Uh, but you get uh, uh, a, a lot easier scalability, which is good enough for some applications. Another challenge uh, uh, or, or another benefit developers saw is those uh, no SQL solutions is what they have been a schema less. That means you would not need to manage a schema. Like, hey, if you need to add another column, you don't need to alter uh, alt table, right, and uh, which can take uh, uh, take a lot of time uh, and be quite uh, uh, quite painful. So, uh, as I mentioned as well, we had many developers which don't quite uh, understand uh, SQL, and that was uh, another issue at that time. Now, uh, another p challenge that we saw at that time is that the MySQL single thread performance was getting worse release after release. And remember, with CPUs not getting faster, getting wider, uh, that was uh, uh, really the problem What we may not get better performance uh, with uh, MySQL upgrades and CPU upgrades uh, compared to previous releases. So here is some graphs to illustrate that. Now, if you can see here, uh, these are kind of uh, results from different MySQL versions. 
uh, you can see what at a high concurrency, every single version, every new version, would generally provide performance improvements, right? You could uh, uh, argue about the shape of this graph, so how much better, but generally the new version would provide better performance at the scale. But at the same time, if you look at, um, uh, if you look at uh, single thread performance, that was kind of going, uh, going down, right? And here is the link uh, here to the blog of uh, uh, Mark Callaghan, who is uh, uh, the self-proclaimed champion of uh, making MySQL single thread performance to suck less, right? So he has been uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, investigations in, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, problem, uh, attracting community attention to it. Now, in terms of 2016, there have not been any uh, big MySQL releases for that, but I think there are a couple of uh, uh, things which are uh, important happening. One is, from our side, we release uh, the first version of our Percona monitoring management product. And why I think that is important, because if you look at the MySQL ecosystem, what, while there is a good open source core database software, right, you can think about uh, per, uh, MySQL, Community Edition, Percona Server, MariaDB, they're all open source, right? When it comes to really, uh, the, that's such a key component as a tool for monitoring, they generally have to be either SaaS or proprietary. MySQL Enterprise Monitor, Monyog, Vivid Cortex, New Relic, right? All of this stuff is not open source. And yes, you can go ahead and build something together, uh, you know, for, for using Nagios and some plugins, right? Or maybe Zabbix. But a lot of that would be do it yourself, which would be, uh, well, uh, pretty hard, right? So uh, that is why we decided to focus our attention on the problem of open source monitoring management first. Another thing I think which is wonderful is what the click house was open source, right? And while it has nothing to do with MySQL, the nice thing about it is uh, it's a, a SQL language uh, which is kind of very fast and massively parallel, which uh, with the help of proxy SQL can execute queries with the MySQL protocol and you can replicate the data from MySQL uh, to, uh, to ClickHouse in many cases easier than using something like Hadoop. And I think that is a very cool solution. If you don't quite want to go uh, all the way to the kind of big data and Hadoop infrastructure, but you want to have your uh, analytical queries to run much, much faster. Even at a single node, ClickHouse may be about 100 times faster than MySQL, right? And, and it can scale to, uh, to a cluster of hundreds of nodes. MySQL in 2017, that is where we get MySQL group replication and also in a DB cluster product, which is, uh, uh, which is close to that. And I think a, a lot of that was based on the success of uh, Galera replication technology and Perconex DB cluster, which is our product based on that, which shows ideas, hey, what people do want to have something more uh, more kind of managed and easy to use than uh, uh, MySQL asynchronous replication. In 2008-18, to date, we get MySQL 8.4 uh, release candidate, uh, which was just recently released. A lot of very cool stuff, right? I mean, uh, I can't wait for MySQL 8 to finally go GA, and I hope that will uh, happen in the next few months, right? That's what release candidate supposed to mean, hopefully. Uh, and from our side, uh, we have shipped the Rogues DB or MyRox uh, storage engine as a part of Percona server. And what MyRox is, the Rogues DB is, and what's wonderful about it is that is a storage engine which Facebook uses to really uh, handle the massive amount of MySQL data uh, much more cost effectively in terms of uh, uh, disk space, SSD wear, and, uh, and performance compared to what we ever could get with. Uh, uh, with um, uh, with uh, in a DB, right? And so uh, now that's uh, available to you uh, in easy to use package from, uh, from Percona server. Now let's look at what uh, is really state of MySQL overall in 2018. I believe by now that is uh, clearly not only the open source database anymore, right? There are other open source databases, you know, uh, uh, PostgreSQL has been growing very rapidly and had a very successful, I think, last uh, three, five years. 
We also have a lot of general purpose, uh, not general purpose databases, right? Like there is in FluxDB for time series data, right? There is uh, uh, a solution such as uh, Neo4j uh, if you uh, are, are looking for uh, graph-based databases, right? So a lot of, uh, or Elasticsearch, right? Uh, again, if you have a certain mm, uh, queries where you, you want to have, uh, you know, full text search and some other application, Elastic is pretty much much better for that than, uh, than MySQL. But obviously MySQL is, uh, uh, is uh, still number one uh, open source relational database. And I think it really is shown how you can use it very successfully with other database technologies as a part of uh, your data layer. If you look at any large scale technology of a company those days, they typically are not using MySQL alone. You would uh, most commonly find it's uh, being used with, for example, Redis uh, uh, for caching, or maybe still, uh, uh, still Memcache, uh, Elastic for full text search. Then data will be probably replicated to something like uh, Hadoop uh, uh, for big data analysis, and that replication will use technologies like Kafka, right? So we see MySQL taking a very important uh, place, but within a portfolio of uh, multiple of uh, uh, technologies in a modern open source data stores uh, stack. We also see MySQL uh, deployed very commonly uh, in the cloud, in, uh, increasingly commonly, both as kind of do-it-yourself environment, right, on EC2, as well as with database as a service provider. And you can see what all major MySQL, uh, all major My cloud providers now have MySQL compatible open source, uh, oh, not open source, but MySQL co compatible not open source database as a service. Let's also look at the modern MySQL scalability and what that means, right? These are, again, uh, the graphs from uh, uh, Oracle Marketing, right? So they probably show us a best case scenario. Uh, and we can see here what the MySQL can uh, reach more than a million of queries per second, right, on the single box. That is a lot of queries. And yes, of course, there is some big ass box which was used here, and these are some very simple queries. Uh, uh, but if you really look at uh, the single MySQL of instance, it can do hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, queries a second of a medium complexity. You can generally do tens of thousands of updates or uh, other kind of right uh, operations and traverse tens of millions of rows, right, uh, in, uh, uh, the, in, your, uh, the, in, uh, uh, the, in your database. And you can run successful databases of uh, multiple terabytes in size, right? And again, this is not uh, some extreme numbers, right? We have uh, uh, customers running 50 terabyte database on a single node, right, for example. Well, that is kind of painful, I'll be honest with you. You know, 50 terabytes on a single node is painful, whatever uh, <laughs> a database it is, but uh, uh, some people are uh, doing that, uh, and that's possible. Now, let's do some math to understand what exactly that means uh, with those numbers, right, for developers, and, and what kind of applications we could build on the single MySQL node. We probably don't want to go single of MySQL node. We probably would have some sort of, uh, uh, you know, replicas, if not for uh, reads, but at least for high viability. But let's just uh, do some math. So even if we uh, reduce those kind of Oracle uh, marking numbers to a much more conservative 100,000 queries per second, and we will think what our application requires 10 years, uh, the 10 queries, right, to serve a user interactions, right, which is pretty common for, you know, uh, mobile apps. That gives us about 10,000 uh, 10, of those user interactions a second, 10,000, uh, right, which it can support, which gives us this kind of big number of user interactions a day. And if you think about our user engagement, which is about 30 of them per day, that can give us about 20 million of daily active users. Of course, you'll say, well, Peter, it cannot be so even, but even if you uh, if you think about your, uh, about your, uh, your kind of classical view, skew, right, with, with, with ours, you're still looking at, uh, you know, uh, 10 million, 15 million of, uh, of users, just a single MySQL can support, right? 
And why I am uh, the, talking about this? Because the MySQL has a lot of a bad press because it is painful to shard. But what I would say out there for 90%, maybe more, of a uh, much more uh, application, you don't really need uh, MySQL sharding, right? And a MySQL plus, uh, plus replication can be a wonderful database to build the application of, um, of a medium size, right? Because majority of applications which are built and exist, they are not Facebook or Google scale, then they are much more uh, uh, manageable uh, uh, scale. Okay, so what kind of uh, challenges we see for MySQL in 2018? Well, one is increasing security and compliance requirement. That is a challenge for, uh, for everyone uh, in the space, right, especially uh, in Europe with kind of uh, GDPR deadline looming on uh, uh, all of us. And that really gets uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, kind of distraction for engineering team, if you like, and as well as it requires the product changes to go against the usability, which is another requirement, right, which modern developers are uh, pushing for. MySQL in containers, while uh, that's very much wanted, that is not really uh, well uh, developed, right, and uh, uh, I think uh, in uh, uh, general, uh, running databases with strong requirements for persistence are kind of uh, still uh, evolving uh, as of right now. We still don't have an easy to use scale out solution. MySQL sharded is a pain now as it was 10 years ago. We can see some new developments like VTest which are designed to uh, make it uh, less painful but they are not so widely uh, adopted yet. Parallel query execution is still, uh, is still not, uh, not there, right, and it's uh, needed now uh, more, uh, more than ever, uh, right, to, for MySQL to be uh, more usable uh, handling the uh, medium complexity queries. Another challenge for MySQL, I believe, is the GPL license, right? Why is that? Because it's kind of gets squeezed between our permissive license, like, for example, Postgres have, which allow everybody to, uh, uh, to use that without kind of fear of what you may be violating some GPL license, especially in not completely open source environment, right? And while I understand all of us here love open source, well, complete uh, open source nirvana is just not a reality yet, right? And uh, uh, the fact that MySQL is G GPL uh, really uh, restricted adoption some in some of the cases. But from the other side, the GPL does not uh, protect MySQL from getting the free riders in the cloud. Right? If you want to run your own cloud MySQL version, right, like, uh, 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 like uh, uh, Amazon uh, does, uh, they, uh, they can easily do that right, uh, uh, in this case. In, in this case, the license such as IAGPL, which uh, MongoDB has, is much more protective for, for a company, right, in, uh, which does not want, uh, 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 to, uh, you know, somebody just to take their IP, add something more on that, and run it in the cloud. I also believe it is uh, what is very painful and disruptive for MySQL is the Oracle uh, reputation. Because uh, there are not too many people which like Oracle. Well, I'm not going to run a pool and ask you to raise your hands to save embarrassment to some of the Oracle folks who have an audience. But believe me, not too many people uh, like Oracle in, uh, in open source uh, uh, community. Right? But the fact is, in my uh, opinion, Oracle has did a fantastic job and all those uh, uh, new MySQL versions 5, uh, 5, 6, 5, 7 released under Oracle uh, umbrella has a very solid engineering, performance improvements, and I would say a better quality than a lot of MySQL versions shipped before that. Now, the real impact of those open source community dislike of Oracle and this kind of bad reputation is what uh, uh, MySQL was removed from uh, number of Linux distribution for what I believe are very misguided reasons. And I think overall that really does not help their uh, MySQL community. 
Okay. Well, that's all I have to say uh, about MySQL and its uh, scalability. But if you would like to learn more about MySQL, about other open source databases, we would welcome you to join us for Percona Live conference taking place in April uh, this year in Santa Clara, uh, United States. And now I'm happy to answer some questions. Uh, if there are any questions, please raise your hands and we'll come with a microphone to you. That's fine. Um, this is from Fox.